Hello everybody and welcome to the Whovian Society Nerve Radio Show. I'm your host Tom Cocker and today I'm joined by Anthony Willis, Lucas Gillett, Callum Veal and Aaron Newbury. We're the committee members of the Whovian Society here at Bournemouth University and we'll be discussing all things Doctor Who and playing music from the show for you all for the next two hours. Now for all you first years who have just started university life here at Bournemouth and are interested in about joining the Whovian Society, I'll now hand you over to the president of the society, Anthony Willis, to tell you how you can join and also tell you about what we do and the many fun things that we get up to. Hello guys, yep, Anthony Willis here, Hoovian President at Bournemouth University. Stop laughing guys, this is really serious. <laughs> yeah. well, yes, well, if you want to join the Hoovian Society, you can either attend any of our events, which I'll tell you about in a second, um, and you can register at one of the events, or you can go onto the Subi website and search for the Hoovian Society under the Club and Societies uh, tab, and just join by there. It's only a pound to join, and that covers everything we do throughout the entire year. Um, what do we do? Well, every... Stop moving me. <laughs> yeah, every year we have, uh, throughout the year we'll have uh, loads of events uh, such as watching episodes of Doctor Who, such as quizzes, and even filming nights where we're going to film a couple of Doctor Who parodies. Um, that's about it. We do have a convention later in uh, February, but we'll tell you about more about that later. Thank you very much, Anthony. So now you know how to become a member of the Whovians Society if you wish to. Now, as I'm sure all you Whovians are aware, Series 8 of Doctor Who began a few weeks ago, and what a great series it's been so far. We've already been treated to some great storylines and characters, not to mention the intriguing story arc involving the Promised Land and the rather elegant Missy. But more on that later. One major element of Doctor Who that everyone never seems to find fault with is the music. So without further ado, here is a piece of music from Series 3 of Doctor Who entitled All the Strange Strange Creatures. This is Nerve Radio, the Doctor Who show. That was all the strange, strange creatures from Series 3 of Doctor Who, composed by the wonderfully talented Murray Gold, conducted by Ben Foster, and performed by the BBC National Orchestra of Wales. Now I think it's time that we discuss the new series of Doctor Who. So guys, what do you think of the series so far, and how well do you think Peter Capaldi is doing as the new Doctor? Uh, yeah, I think he's doing not a bad job. Um... I, he's obviously not as uh, sexy or handsome as the other two Doctors uh, that or we've had so far. Us, so. Well, nobody's quite as sexy as handsome as us, Lucas. Um, but he, uh, he's doing a good job of being the father figure to Clara, and, and uh, he's got that dark side that I think everyone uh, of the old fans was uh, looking for, certainly, uh, and a lot of the new fans as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's certainly very different, this series. Sort of things kind of you, you got used to and that you expected don't really happen anymore. <laughs> Like, oh, old Doctor will save the day. Oh, no, 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 never mind. Clara's got to do it. Prat, He's yeah. being a prat. He's being a prat. i with Robin Hood. Never mind. He'll get around to it. <laughs> yeah, I think um, uh, Peter Capaldi's Doctor is the dark Doctor we've been needing. I mean, during the classic series, we had uh, the Sixth and Seventh Doctors as a dark Doctor, but the budget, shall we say, was lacking uh, back then, and the quality of the show wasn't as good as it is today. So we've got the perks of a dark Doctor and the budget of the new series he's also really mean to people he's like really sarcastic all the time which is actually quite funny because he's whilst he's a bit whilst he's a hero as well he's also a bit nasty to Clara and Mr Pink as well he's a bit mean to Mr Pink he is, and yeah. everyone loves Mr Pink so <laughs> it's not very good <clears throat> I mean, personally, I think Series 8 is really good. You could definitely see the darker side uh, compared to the series that David Tennant and Matt Smith are in, for example. Moffat really knows how to write a dark series when needed to suit the Doctor. And, yeah, going back to Danny Pink, I think he's a really good character, and I'm interested to see whether the Doctor will grow to like him or just dislike him even more, to be honest. Are we, uh, are we talking about Danny now? Because... I um I just yeah if if we're talking about Danny now I I'm gonna pitch in right now. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I quite like him because I didn't expect to after seeing some of the uh, trailing material uh, earlier on in the year. But um, now that he's really gotten into uh, his character, I guess, and um, especially in the most recent episode, I think he's he's really come into his own um, and and presented a bit of an opposition for the Doctor, if nothing else. Uh, mm. Really like Danny. Well, I think he's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy now, because apparently they have great-grandchildren. We rather have to like them, because he seems to be rather there to stay. Yeah, on the whole. have a choice but on the matter. Exactly. <laughs> Whether we do or not, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I think only in the last episode he actually became a character. Recently mm, yeah. he's just been a sort of clinger-on, because Clara was there, yeah, Mr. Pink right. kind of was. But yeah. in the last episode he actually had his own storyline, so he has become a character now. Yeah, I think um, when it comes to Danny, I mean, obviously the Doctor doesn't like him because he doesn't like soldiers. Um, and a lot of people have said, well, this kind of goes against what the Doctor's done before. I mean, in the third Doctor, he worked for 
unit, a military organisation. Um, but and Captain Jack, of course. Um, but I'd say it's, I'd say Capaldi's hatred of soldiers is perfect for the Doctor at this point in his life. Because obviously, with the Third Doctor, he was a lot younger. And if you actually watch some of the episodes, him and the Brigadier don't get on as on together as as you'd expect. I mean, there's uh, one episode where um, he's basically uh, shunning the Brigadier um, for essentially the first half of the episode because of the events that happened in the previous episode because he decided to kill the Silurians which is against what the Doctor wanted to do um, so I think the the Doctor's uh, hatred of uh, soldiers isn't against the Doctor's character in any way <laughs> sorry I, um, but at least partially I think it's because the, this Doctor in particular doesn't like big parts of himself. He sees the darkness in his soul, and with the episode with Rusty the Dalek, he he, said he was very upset that darkness had been found. And I think he blames the part of himself that is a soldier there. Because in the last episode, Danny said he's an officer. And he is. He makes people do things. He's used to ordering people around and getting people out of the situation. And he fights, you know, a lot for a peaceful man. So I think part of the reason he doesn't like Dan- Danny being a soldier... Is because he himself sees himself as a soldier, and he doesn't want that for Clara. He wants Clara to go home and have a nice, safe existence away from him, and he probably sees Danny at least partially as bringing her back to that. Yeah, I mean, um, the the Doctor always wants the best to happen to his companions. So if he thinks that she's obviously get, Clara is going to be around a dangerous person, to, well, not now, but as he used to be, um, kind of, then yeah, he's just definitely going to look out for, for what's best for Clara and any other future companions and past companions that we've seen, to be honest. Is there anything else you guys want to add to that? Uh, oh, Aaron. <laughs> tragic silence. If John Barrowman does come back, um, I think the Doctor should be very nice to him because Christopher Eccleston's Doctor wasn't actually, for the first few episodes, didn't like him very much at all, did he? He was a bit no, mean actually. with his yeah, sonic yeah. gun and things. <laughs> he didn't like him very much at all. But then again, he did nearly get Rose killed. And the Doctor was a bit sensitive about that. Just a touch. <laughs> well, I think Jack should come back in the next episode. And in fact, every episode to follow. Yes. According to Aaron Newbury. Yes. <laughs> I don't think uh, Jack should come back. I think they should just do another uh, series of Torchwood, um, but set in the far future. Because uh, uh, we know that from the face of Bo that Jack is going to live for millions and millions of years. So why do we need to have another se- series of Torchwood that's set in the modern day as such. I love the fact that we've managed to have an off-topic argument within the first, like, <laughs> ten high. minutes of the show. Already we, we veered off what we were uh, talking about. So, yeah, okay. Back to then the new series. What's everyone's favourite episode so far? Oh, that's quite a good one. Yeah. Personally, I think mine is the caretaker that's just gone. I think it was absolutely fantastically well-written Very and funny. a lot of character development, in my opinion. <laughs> Sorry, we're giving spoilers away to someone in the series. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Um, I'd say my favourite is the episode of Robin Hood. I mean, it gets a bit of a mixed review, but it was funny. And it, w- it was just a bit ridiculous, and I like that. No. <laughs> Come on, Aaron, let's be accepting of everybody's views here. <laughs> Even if they're wrong. <laughs> oh, oh. Well, fine then. What's yours then, Aaron? Mr. Holier Than Thou. My favourite episode so far has got to be the one with Rusty the Dalek in it. I I quite liked that particular episode. Does Rusty remind you of yourself when y- you were a boy? Yes, yes, he does. <laughs> it's deeply Freudian. Yeah. <laughs> You're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the best episode of the series has got to be Listen. It, I agree. it links back to the 50th anniversary so perfectly, uh, an episode which I was really disappointed with. Um, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to rant about the 50th anniversary. There's plenty of time for that in the oh, future. No. <laughs> no, the it basically... Fills, fills in, in my opinion, what is a, a few plot holes of the 50th anniversary, and it basically gives a lot more character development of the Doctor than 50 years of Doctor Who has managed to do so. There's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of plot hole filling this series actually, which uh, and a lot of response to the fans as well. Um, in that, we'll, we'll, there's been comment there's been comments on um, Capaldi's outfit and things like that, and and there's, they've always been mentioned now in the show, like the fact. You know, oh, I was going for magician. Uh, I was going for a minimalist, but came out magician. Um, so that Moffat seems to be responding much more to the, the to the audience. Yeah. In fairness, Moffat is Moffat. <laughs> <laughs> he is essentially a fan of the show. Every single one of his scripts is fan fiction. 
<laughs> I, I, there's no going around that. Let's I not stray into a dark area. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fairness, I mean, you can tell, I mean, by the fact you said about the magician, it's obviously just Moffat just copying and pasting from comments from, the, yeah, from online. That's true. No, yeah. There's an element of that to it. But that's kind of nice, though, because it feels like as fans, our comments are being heard and noticed. And yeah. more does with it. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Some very interesting views and opinions there. And if you listeners at home would like to share your opinion on the series so far, or anything else Doctor Who related, please feel free to get in touch with us on Twitter by finding us at, at Nerve Radio or at BU Whovian Sock. Now, as we've just been discussing the Doctor, I think it's only fitting that we play one of the themes of the Time Lords. So here is I Am the Doctor from Series 5 of Doctor Who. This is Nerve Radio, the Doctor Who show. That was I Am the Doctor from Series 5 of Doctor Who. Now each series of Doctor Who always seems to have a story arc which leads up to the finale of the series, and Series 8 isn't any different. We've been introduced to the mysterious Mary Poppins-like character called Missy, who claims that she's in Heaven, or the Promised Land, and she seems to be collecting new people from the series who have died. Most recently we saw Missy in last night's episode, The Caretaker, and she looked she looked like she was up to no good. Sorry for those who haven't seen the episode yet. So guys, what are your opinions on the Promised Land and Missy so far? It's quite a curious one. It's unusual to reference Heaven. In you know a science fiction show. I um the most interesting theory that I've heard is that uh, heaven or the nether sphere, which I'm I'm a little unsure of further into the series. But uh, the best one I've heard so far is that it's actually the Doctor's mind, um, or or where he puts all the pe- people he's guilty about having let down or or letting die really. <laughs> but that doesn't really work with last night's episode. Well, exactly. That, yeah, because he never met that guy. So woo. <laughs> yeah, we. I absolutely hate this theory. My personal favourite theory is that it is a time lady that um, knew the Doctor. Because we, the fact we in listen, we have seen more of the Doctor's past um, does suggest they're going to sort of tell us more about the Doctor's time on Gallifrey. And um, I really want Missy to be someone who has a grudge against the Doctor and has done for the last two thousand years of his life, or just his sister, you know. And it's really bad sibling rivalry because that'd be great. <laughs> Don't forget, Missy did refer to the Doctor as her boyfriend. Weird family. They're very close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a very old version of Clara. I think this could be the case if it hadn't been for Listen. Uh, because that kind of hints that uh, Clara is just going to uh, live to a nice old age um, with Danny and have loads of children. So I don't, I don't think it can be an old version of Clara. It might be an old version of one of the versions of Clara from Name of the Doctor. Oh, yeah, um, thousands of different Claras. Yeah, yeah, it could be one of them. Think of the possibilities. Mm. <laughs> or another one I heard was that it would be River, because I know they said that they they were done with the storyline. But frankly, Moffat's lied before he does, so it's possible. It's a bit strange with what her calling her him her boyfriend rather than her husband. But you know, different incarnations. I d- I th- I generally think that. River's story is done. She may like if they did like a one-off special of something. She might like, for example, if they did an anniversary of the new series, they might have uh, Matt Smith come back and River just be the companion just to bring her back for an episode. But I don't think. Oh, I didn't that... say it was you know likely. I just said it was possibility. Yeah, I, d- I heard. He did mention her in the most uh, recent episode, which was quite interesting considering we did think that the storyline was probably gone. You know. Yeah, I mean. Th- then again, we did have a reference to Amy in Deep Breath, so I don't think that... Because um, Doctor Who has always been about referencing itself thousands and thousands <laughs> of times. I mean, I, th- I think if if we went through the next few series without mentioning River, it would seem weird. Even if she doesn't appear, just n- no reference to it. It would just seem like the Doctor's just ignoring that part of his life now. Well, that's how I felt a lot with the um, revamp when it went from Tennant to Smith. That they they did a bit of which, which of course, is ne- necessary for the show to carry on. Um, which is just dumping the rest and forgetting all about it. So it is nice to have a few links. But uh, I miss Rose. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say what I know. You're all deliberately avoiding. It could be the Rani, 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 Rani. That's <laughs> damn it, Aaron. <laughs> that's what I initially f- thought. As soon as I saw her in Deep Breath, I'm like, she reminds me a lot of the Rani from the classic series. Mm. But whether she's or not, I, I honestly don't know. Um, but she's got the very similar uh, characteristics, in my opinion, anyway. Don't know about you guys. I don't think it'll be the Rani. The female reincarnation of the Master, just that to be clear. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, Missy, Master. Mm. Sure. Parallels there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think it'll be um, uh, the Rani, mainly because the rights um, of the use of the Rani aren't available to the BBC. And... Way to cut us down, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't... Uh, that, 
there is that, and I don't think she's a well-known enough character uh, to bring back. I know a lot of the hardcore fans of Doctor Who know who she is, but the 99% of the viewers that are going to be watching the episode do not know who the Rani is. All the people who started with New Who don't know who anyone is. They brought the Master back. Yeah, no, but the Master is, in my opinion... um, sort of just as well known as the Daleks. There's only so many people they can bring back, so they may as well start with the bigger ones. Yeah. Ronnie had a whole two episodes, you know. Yeah, no, but that isn't a lot. <laughs> they did yeah, bring it's more back. than some people. Mm. They brought back the Ice Warriors, they only had about two episodes. Yeah, and they did, then again, they did bring back the Zygons, um, and they were only in the classic the classic series for one episode, so. It's now lamenting exactly. about the classic. They did bring back Rassilon as well, and he wasn't really referenced very much at all. Oh, Rassilon! No, don't, don't. I'm going to go, go that, man. No one's going to understand that reference, Lucas. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> we should point out that um, the Whovian Society Committee does have a tendency to, whenever we say something, to go, there's something of Rassilon. It's all... We're all single, just... Uh... <laughs> wow. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> single. <laughs> two <We> should be. <laughs> two-fifths, of, two-fifths of ours aren't. They're still available, ladies! <laughs> Yay! Well, thank you very much for that ending there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> now, as you already know from the released filming pictures of Series 8, Missy is going to be appearing in the final episode. So let's cast our minds back to the final episode of Series 2 of Doctor Who, which involved a rather emotional oh goodbye... Be- <laughs> which involved a rather emotional goodbye between the Tenth Doctor and Rose. Get your tissues at the ready to relive the moment all over again as we play Doomsday from Series 2 of Doctor Who. This is Nerve Radio, the Doctor Who show. That was Doomsday from Series 2 of Doctor Who. Callum just wants to share a little interesting fact that he found out during the song just, that just played. Uh, well, no, it's just uh, the um, episode Doomsday was set uh, partially in a place called Darling Umstranden, which is supposedly in Norway, um, filmed in Cardiff, as everything ever in Doctor Who is. Um, but Darling Umstranden doesn't actually mean Bad Wolf Bay, as many people... Uh, well, as Doctor Who told us that it did, it actually means rubbish Wolf Bay in Norwegian. <laughs> so Darling Umstranden is the NAF Wolf Bay. Could uh, be trying a bit harder, Wolf Bay. It's it's not really that <laughs> impressive, Wolf Bay. So It's not someone you'd write home about, Wolf Bay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that, guys. Um, now, a few episodes of Series 8 of Doctor Who have featured robots. We've had the half-faced man from Deep Breath, we've had the robot and the sh- sheriff from Robots of Sherwood, and we've had Rusty the Dalek from Into the Dalek, of course. But I want to know which make the better robots, the good characters or the bad characters. So guys, if you could be either K-9 or Rusty, for example, who would you rather pick, and what advantages and disadvantages do you think there would be? Rusty's not technically a robot. He's a Dalek, kind of. Technically, then, none of them are robots, because Deep Breath's an android by this point. <laughs> We're getting too technical here, guys. <laughs> Rusty or K9? <laughs> um, I'd rather be Rusty, to be honest. I mean, uh, K9 is, at it's the end of the day... <laughs> K- K- K9 is limited to his um, programming, whereas Rusty does have the potential to develop as a character. Um, so, I mean, unless the Doctor does a software patch for, Ru- for K9, there's not, there's not going to be any character development. That would be such an interesting episode. <laughs> Welcome to Doctor Who Software Patching. <laughs> oh no, I've got a stack overflow. <laughs> oh god. K9 must now shut down to do essential updates. <laughs> Just blue screens. <laughs> blue screen K9. <laughs> I'd rather be K9. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> back on track. Yeah, on to point. <laughs> Everyone needs a tin dog. Uh, yeah, K9's, you know, he's got. He's sparky, eh? Sparky. Uh, can't go. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wouldn't. I'd like to own K9 more than I'd like to own Rusty, because I can't really feel like I'd take Rusty down the shops <laughs> per se. Walkies, Rusty. <laughs> Whereas, like with K9, it's like I've got heavy shopping. I'll just put him on top of K9. He can trundle it home for me. Do you have the broccoli? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Owning Rusty the Dalek is the best plan. In the, that was my Nicolas Cage impression that was for the people on the webcam mm-hmm. uh, yeah I'm not sure owning Rusty would be a viable solution as he wants to kill everything uh, only the Daleks well what if what if I what if I had a little plastic Dalek and he wanted to get see gotta think about these things why would you have I, a plastic Dalek you've got a real Dalek <laughs> that's a very good point <laughs> um, I, I'd much rather have K9 the only thing is I couldn't really pay fetch with K9 because he hasn't got a mouth to pick it up he could pick it up on that little sucker thing that he he, he used once Anthony, shush. <laughs> ages ago. Uh, I'd have K9 because then I could say, K9, is this right? Affirmative. He would say, the novelty would wear off quite soon. Though, but... 
Yeah, no, you could sort of play fetch with K9 because you just throw the stick and he just evaporates it with his laser. Imagine if the voice recognition with K9 was as bad as Siri. You go, K9, fetch, and then he just brings you the weather updates and you're like, no, <laughs> no, bad boy. I like how this conversation's gone on to who you'd rather own rather than, than who you'd rather be. But, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a robot. I'm quite happy being here. Well, that's true. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I'd rather, if it was a choice between being one of them, I'd rather be Rusty, but as a good Rusty, as we initially thought he was, because if something ever did come up that required weapons, I'd just say Rusty was more powerful because he is a Dalek. But that's just my opinion. I don't know if you guys agree. It's not always violence. It's not always the answer. <laughs> yeah. Just if you have a problem and you think, it's a good job I've got a giant death ray, isn't it? <laughs> if you've got a canine, mean... he can, like, analyse it and... And then kill it with his death ray. And then kill it with his death ray. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for that, Aaron, and thank you guys for your opinions there. <laughs> now, seeing as they're on the subject of robots, why not celebrate two of Doctor Who's most iconic robotic monsters? Here are the themes of the Daleks and the Cybermen from Series 2 of Doctor Who. This is Nerve Radio, the Doctor Who show. Well, that was the Daleks and the Cybermen from Series 2 of Doctor Who. Two very powerful themes for two very powerful monsters there. Now, we've been discussing our theories on what may happen later on in Series 8 of Doctor Who, but we want to hear what you think at home. So, as I mentioned earlier, go onto Twitter and contact us via Nerve Radio, at Nerve Radio on Twitter, or at Whovian, BU Whovian Sock, sorry, and tell us what you think of the series so far, and any theories you may have, and I'll try to read them out later on in the show. Here's one response we've had from a listener called Ashley Richards, and he says, When, Com- when Capaldi was first announced as the new Doctor, the majority of Whovians weren't happy because he was older. However, when Deep Breath was publicly aired... It purely proved that Capaldi was still the Doctor. I also liked how Moffat cleverly persuaded the audience to accept an older actor, and because of this, it changed many people's views on him. Moving further into the series, Moffat has really shown Capaldi, Cap- Capaldi's Doctor as a witty old grandpa, which could easily be referred to William Hartnell's Doctor when the show began in 1963. Overall, Capaldi has really proved himself and is personally one of my favourite Doctors. Thank you for that, Ashley. I'm just going to open that to Anthony. Um, do you think Capaldi can be related to William Hartnell's Doctor? Um, to an extent, I mean, I'm not a really big fan of William Hartnell's Doctor, um, mainly because of the style of the show back then. It is a little bit too different to what it is today. Um, uh, I mean, I still like it. I still prefer classic series Doctor Who to the new series of Doctor Who. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really warming to uh, Peter Capaldi as the Doctor. He's definitely in my top three at this stage, and he's only done a few episodes. And William Hartnell just... No, I, I I find it very hard to link the two of them apart from the fact they're both the same age. That's It's very hard for me to say they are very similar to each other. The, William Hartnell did show his um, darker sides um, every now and then, but outside of that, I can't see, I can't see it. No, fair enough. I mean, the, the, the thing that makes reminds me of Capaldi's reference to William Hartnell is in the episode Listen, where towards the end he was like going, Clara, TARDIS now, being the really bossy grandpa. Kind of like how Hartnell was um, back in the, the olden days, you could say now. Um, so that's just uh, our opinions anyway. So as well as the purely orchestral music that is played in every episode of Doctor Who, we often have music which involves lyrics. These songs usually relate to the show or a character in some shape or form. So here is one of the songs including lyrics called Abigail's Song, otherwise known as Silence is All You Know, from the Doctor Who Christmas special episode A Christmas Carol. The Doctor Who Show on Nerve Radio. That was Abigail's Song from the Christmas special A Christmas Carol, sung by the fantastic Catherine Jenkins. Doctor has seen many famous historical characters throughout the years, including Charles Dickens, William Shakespeare and Winston Churchill. All these characters have helped the Doctor to save the world, but guys, who do you think provided the most help to the Doctor when he needed the assistance? Um, well, Shakespeare in Shakespeare's Code was uh, quite a brilliant character. I mean, if it weren't for him, the day wouldn't have been saved. It was only his uh, literally... um, uh, Literary, <laughs> more like. Yes, th- thank you for the grammar, Nazi. Um, yeah, um, his skills at writing um, uh, uh, that saved the day, basically. Um, I think Winston Churchill. Maybe not the most useful, but certainly the funniest. <laughs> Just wandering in, stealing the TARDIS key. He's like, you think I could win the war so quickly? <laughs> Churchill is a great character in that sense. He is very witty. Callum, what's your opinion? Who who's your favourite historical character? I was trying to think of them first. <laughs> I mean, as obviously it was introduced to be a historical show, uh, and going back straight away to the cavemen who were in episode one of you know the old classical series, 
um, who were not exactly a help to the Doctor. Um, I say. But I, I really like the aspect that they involve historical characters and s- historical events um, that make the Doctor seem part of the events or something that you thought was explained. No, 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 it was the Doctor, of course. Uh, it's, it's quite a nice aspect of the show. I agree with Anthony on the William Shakespeare point. A quick apology for the uh, the mild Nazi <laughs> reference there. Uh, no, no offence intended. You, you said, oh. Um, so uh, we'll just move swiftly on yeah, from that. I, think I liked William Shakespeare, I think, because he was the person that saved it, as Mr Willis said. Not the Doctor, really. Mm. He saved the day because he was a genius. Yeah, a literary genius. Ooh. Yeah, um, like I say, Churchill, I think, is a very witty character, and he's probably personally my favourite character. He he was never afraid to ask the Doctor if he needed help, and just like all the other uh, historical characters as well, I mean, Dickens, when he was trying to fight the Gelf, that, that he really helped out, and he. what I seem to find is with the historical characters, they always seem to have a thing for the companions. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys agree with that. I would disagree. I oh, think really? there is... A few of the stories not told, like Eleventh Doctor's mar- marriage to Marilyn Monroe, <laughs> but never gets publicly done, and I think that's a real shame because he n- seems to know all these people. Like when he was, you know, Amy was on the phone to Church, was like, "Yes, which Prime Minister?" He's so many people that he has clearly met and was never mentioned in the show. I do like the recurring Queen Elizabeth and how the Doctor married Queen Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. They, they've never explained. I don't think they've ex- done that justice, and I think they should explore it again. My s- yeah. One of the many problems with the 50th anniversary episode. For God's sake. <laughs> Here we Not go. Again. <laughs> don't bring up the 50th anniversary in tweets. Please don't. We'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. Of course, as well as all the famous historical characters who the Doctor's met, how can we forget all the wonderful companions he's allowed through the TARDIS stars for an adventure in space and time? Let's now listen to the theme of the Doctor's most recent and current companion known as the Impossible Girl. This is Clara from Series 7 of Doctor Who. This is Nerve Radio, the Doctor Who show. That was Clara from Series 7 of Doctor Who. Now, there have been mixed opinions of Clara amongst fans, with some liking the companion and some who aren't so keen. So, guys, what do you think of Clara, and what sort of things do you think she's doing right and even wrong as the Doctor's companion? Well, um, I'm taking this opportunity shamelessly to gain boyfriend points uh, with my (laughs) girlfriend who's listening now um, to say that I think Clara's a fantastic character, uh, especially throughout this series. I I genuinely believe this. I'm not just (laughs) just making this up. He Um, is, he is. (laughs) Hey, uh, that Clara actually does... um, uh, The companions are are the most important part of Doctor Who because they provide our uh, contact with the Doctor, the the strange and unusual world in which he lives. And Clara... um, acts as a very bringing the Doctor back down to earth, which is the role that, that she should play, and she does it really well, and has been getting more involved as the series has gone on. And I'm going to then take the opportunity to lose major friend points with the <laughs> same girlfriend, and say she's alright, but they're in better companions. I can see her already, she's going to be raging and rolling her eyes. Um, like, I was watching the beginning of Smith, not so long ago, and Amy was just so much more competent. Like, with the Sky Whale, she was like shut up, Aaron. <laughs> She was just like, no, 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 Doctor, you shouldn't kill the Star Whale. She was thinking about things so much more. And maybe that's just the way the show's been written. And maybe Clara is a bit of a, I don't know, byproduct of her time. But I find that I've liked her more in Capaldi, just because she actually does more stuff. Yeah. I mean, being a fan of the classic series over the new series, um, I really don't like it when the companions take centre stage above the Doctor. I mean, I prefer it when it's the Doctor that saves the day and the companions are just there to be the one that he saves. Um, But if we are going down the sort of... in the way TV has changed over the years, it has to be more every character has character development, then if that is what we're going for, then Clara is the perfect companion. As a story to tell, um, the interaction between them both works very well. Rather than just saying, this is Doctor Who, the Doctor saves the day all the time. As a story about these two individuals, w- mm. them working well together has, has created quite an interesting comparison on the show. And Yeah, I quite like that, but again, I feel like Clara takes too much of it so much sometimes. Like the Rings of Akaten, it was a great bit. It really showed what the Doctor was and what he was capable of. And then it was like, no, 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 that's not good enough. Clara needs to be involved. And it, I feel like it took away from something. 
Yeah, it really should have been the doctor. Um, his speech that he gave, that should have been the thing that saved the day, not a leaf. I think it was more, the, obviously, the potential. It could have been anyone's potential as opposed to just Clara's um, potential future. It was it was just the fact that that was the potential future of her of her life. All right, dude, you've gained enough boyfriend points now, OK? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to sit back now. She's uh, already pleased, OK? Hi, Neil! <laughs> I, uh, I prefer Clara to Amy because I think... Fight me, IRL. All Amy did, <laughs> all Amy did was pout and complain. Whereas Clara actually does something. That's all Capaldi does, but he's just really yeah, clever but, about but it. <laughs> he's also Scottish. Academics are allowed. She's Amy she. Scottish. But I know. I think. I think Clara is. She's a better companion because she actually does something more than run around and need to be saved all the time. She's a strong female character. Amy's a strong female Don't character. Don't mean no man. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we've rather got stuck on like eleventh companions. So yeah. Um. I mean, compared to Series 7 and Series 8, there's definitely been some character development within Clara. Uh, straight away from Deep Breath, I noticed it. And I think she's just becoming a more independent companion as well. Uh, that's my opinion. We don't need no man, except she now has two. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we want to talk about um, com- uh, companions getting too involved, we could just call our minds back to David Tennant actually falling in love with Rose. Uh, and a lot that did outrage quite a few people, I think. Mm-hmm. Don't get me started on that one, Callum. You know how long I could talk so, about Tom, this. So, what's, Tom, what, what's the next topic? <laughs> well, thanks for that, guys. Um, so, Doctor Who was revamped in 2005 after a long break. Many people were delighted to find out that the show was going to be making a return to TV with a brand new Doctor played by Christopher Eccleston. Eccleston only stayed in Doctor Who for one series, leaving his role as the ninth Doctor in the episode The Parting of the Ways. In this episode, we saw the Doctor regenerate like never before. So let's travel back in time to 2005 and listen to the music that played as the ninth Doctor regenerated. This is Hologram from Series 1 of Doctor Who. This is Nerve Radio, the Doctor Who show. That was Hologram from Series 1 of Doctor Who. So as I just mentioned, Doctor Who came back onto our screens in 2005 and has been with us ever since. There have been some great series over the years, but I want to know which has been the best series since the show's revamp. So guys, which has been your favourite series and why? Um, my favourite series, I mean, it's up for competition now that Capaldi's done such a good job, in my opinion, but um, would would be the Series 4 specials uh, with David Tennant, as that's his regeneration uh, his series, as it was. His swung song, yeah. Um, and as him being my favourite Doctor... I I would say yeah, series four, uh, the the Water of Mars, one of the best episodes of Doctor Who ever, in my opinion. Take the stage, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean uh, that's a very difficult one for me because it really, I mean, on ret- in retrospect of all the other series, I don't enjoy them now as much as I did when I watched them live because obviously it's a new episode of Doctor Who. You have that excitement that you're seeing something you've never seen before, um, but. If we're going for rewatchability, if we ignore series eight, because obviously that hasn't finished yet, I'd say it would have to be, it would have to be series five, Matt Smith's first series, because uh, with Stephen Moffat writing um, brilliantly uh, most of the episodes of that series and the direction he was taking the show, I enjoyed it a lot more than I did with any anything Rossity Davis did. Um, I do feel as Matt Smith progressed, although he like Matt Smith's Doctor and all the characters around him got better i do feel that the series as a whole weren't as good each time um but series five i'd say is what i would if i was introducing someone to the show for the first time i would start them off with series five i'm gonna say series four shut up at overacting i know you leave it alone um i wasn't sure about donna at first i thought Catherine tate on top to who <sighs> weird but it was just was something. It was just a fun series just with random daughters showing up and them just saying, Oi, we're not mating with you, sunshine. It was just good. Um, and as much as I like the romantic subplots, don't get me wrong, I like a good romantic subplot as much as anyone, I just liked that he was just friends with Donna. It made it more of a show that I would watch for fun than because I'd watch because, oh, so-and-so is falling in love with so-and-so and that's so adorable and beautiful and I love it. <laughs> So yeah, I'd say four is my favourite. Thomas? Uh, yeah, I agree with you there, Lucas. Even though Matt Smith's, my, even though Matt Smith's my favourite Doctor and one of his series should be my favourite, I have to agree with Series 4 simply because of Donna and I think Catherine Tate's character is just fantastic. She makes me laugh every episode without fail. Um, oh, Aaron wants to butt in. I think um, Series 10 of Doctor Who, <laughs> uh, where Capaldi's in his about third or fourth season, is really good. And this is only it. available to time travelling listeners, by the way. <laughs> and Aaron, because he has powers beyond our understanding. <laughs> Obviously. 
Okay, and if you want to share your opinions, guys, then please tweet at Nerve Radio or at BU Whovian Sock. So Series 6 revealed the major story of who River Song was. We found out that she was Amy and Rory's daughter, and we also discovered that she was the Doctor's wife. Spoilers. So, <laughs> so now let's listen to the track during the scene when the Doctor and River got married. This is the wedding of River Song from Series 6 of Doctor Who. This is Nerve Radio, the Doctor Who show. That was the wedding of River Song from Series 6 of Doctor Who, a personal favourite of mine. Now, we first met River Song during Series 4 of Doctor Who in the episode Silence in the Library and Forest of the Dead, a time when we as an audience didn't really know who River was. There were many speculations on who she was until we finally found out, so we've taken to the internet to find some fan theories of who River Song was before it was revealed. So, I'm going, sorry, to hand you over to the committee to read some of our favourite fan, theory, fan theories out. Uh, well... At the time, my favourite fan theory would have to be that she was the Rani, because it was absolutely ridiculous, because I know at that stage in the show, uh, Rusty Davis was um, very into bringing uh, classic series characters back, um, but, but the Rani is so unknown, and I'm, now she isn't as much, because uh, Big Finish, the audio stories have brought her back, um, and um, obviously... As the fan base has grown, people have looked into the classic series a bit more, so it'd be more likely she'd come back now. But back then, sort of, um, there's, there was no reason for her to be coming back, and the, the, the character of River Song in Science of the Library just made no sense to be the Rani. My personal favourite was that she was the Doctor's mum, because apparently with time or parenting, you don't say, oh, hey, uh, long time no see, which like a cuppa. No, no, it's looking at a diary going, spoilers. <laughs> and then, like, shooting them flirty glances, because, <laughs> like, it didn't make any sense. Whose mother acts like that? No one's mother ever in the history of the universe. Even with aliens, it's a bit weird. For those of you who know Lucas, um, this is <laughs> <laughs> this is the he's blatantly lying. This is exactly what his family are like. <laughs> My mother has never shot me a flirty glance. Not whilst we've been around. <laughs> Moving swiftly on from that, uh, let's keep looking at the the fan theories, Callum. My my favourite theory is that she's she uh, she might be an older Amy Pond um, because it wasn't actually too far off uh, considering that again spoilers uh, she was uh, Amy's mother a daughter. daughter daughter I'll just yeah I'll just mess around and uh, why not she's a- she's Amy's cousin I, I don't, I don't <laughs> twice <care>. removed <laughs> um, but yeah considering that nobody actually knew a thing back then. Not a bad guess, really. Yeah, and given that we're talking about uh, science and library, that is very impressive. They managed to say that she was related to Amy. <laughs> I mean, what I uh, picked up as soon as we saw the first two episodes, the moment I thought, oh, they might be married or something, is when, um, I forgot his name, uh, said that, oh, you're acting like an old married couple. I thought, well, that's a massive giveaway by Moffat already that it, yeah. could, that it could be a potential Classic. husband-wife relationship there. Um, but yeah. that's just me. At the time, I just thought, oh, it's a Moffat red herring. He's, he's, he's not going to marry them. And then he did, which really annoyed me. <laughs> Moffat fooling you. And then, oh, wait, no, it's it's like a triple cross with Moffat. Everything, everything he ever does is just, <laughs> no, no, I was lying. I was lying about lying. And now, no, you were right all along. <laughs> Moffat, I actually love you in real life. Please don't hate us. <laughs> yeah, Moffat, if you're listening, then, the yeah, come around to our convention. Yeah, it'd be great. <laughs> um, on the other theories, again, family, it's his daughter, Jenny. Because, again, you know, father-daughter relationships, I often think my dad would be okay if I called him sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 you know, oh, hey, sweetie, good time at work. This is the exact sort of thing I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I think River Song became too much... I'm, I'm going to complain, I'm sorry. She became too much about... <laughs> the, the book she always had, the diary, it was Moffat's way of patching over plot holes for the whole season. It was like, oh, it's in the book. Oh, it was in the book. Doctor I didn't like it. Needs I didn't a get-out like clause because it's always going the to sonic cross over something or <laughs> some continu- continuity <laughs> error. That's the kind of the point. It's a family show. It doesn't always have to make sense. Exactly. It would be overly serious if it did. So the fact that it doesn't really take itself too seriously and says, oh, there's going to be plot holes kind of makes it better. Yeah. Have you been to a convention? There are fans that take it way too seriously. And those people need to just relax a little bit. <laughs> need to calm down, take a chill pill, Speaking have a bath. Of conventions, we are organising a Hoogan <laughs> Society <laughs> convention. Oh, shameless man. plug. Yeah. <laughs> when, when is it? We are nothing if not shameless. It's, it's February the 21st of... Uh, 
uh, to that uh, February 21st. <laughs> February 21st, 2015. <laughs> Are you getting this down, listeners? <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 <laughs> yeah, if you check our website, whovian.co.uk, um, we will announce information about the convention on there in the coming weeks. All that we but can say at the, the moment... the 21st of March, February? February. All we can say at the moment is there are a lot of uh, special guests and interesting things that you should definitely come and see. So do check it out on our website. We didn't actually say the date yet. What is the actual date? Yeah, it's February 21st, 2015. Excellent. And if we have time at the end of the show, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So they were some of our favourite fan, th- fan theories that we found out online. During the episode Forest of the Dead, we saw Riversong die in the library to save the Doctor. However, it turned out that even though the Doctor still... Even though River technically did die, the Doctor still managed to save her by giving River his sonic screwdriver, allowing him to save her to the library's hard drive. So let's now listen to the track when the Doctor is racing against time to save River. This is the Doctor's theme from Series 4 of Doctor Who. The Doctor Who Show on Nerve Radio. That was the Doctor's theme from Series 4 of Doctor Who. We've had a few tweets in, so I'm just going to read a couple of those out now. Uh, Shelby says... I agree with Anthony that Listen is the best episode of the current series, and Clara Sass is on point. Thank you, Shelby, for your tweet. Safi says, uh, loving you all on the radio, so thank you very much there, Safi. And she wants to give a little shout-out to the best Doctor ever, which is Peter Davison, in her opinion. (laughs) 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 Such a dig. (laughs) And Addison says, some of the Doctors uh, are no longer with us. Without blowing the budget, how would you make a multi-Doctor story without all of them in? We'll come to that towards the end of the show. So during Silence in the Library and Forest of the Dead, we were introduced to an enemy that couldn't be seen called the Vashti Narada. The Vashti Narada aren't the only invisible enemies we've had on Doctor Who. We've also had the mysterious copycat creature from the Series 4 of Midnight, and more recently we've had the frightening creature from Listen. But there has been speculation on whether there was actually a monster in the episode Listen, or if anything, or if everything was just set inside the Doctor and everybody's head, leading the true creature to be fear itself. So guys, do you think there was a monster in the episode, or do you think the, ca- it, the monster was just in the character's head causing the fear to be the true monster to conquer fear you must become fear sorry <laughs> i think the um the monster was actually the same one as from midnight um we got the same bangs on the spaceship door uh, as we did in midnight um and i think it's it's th- there are so many similarities it would be a little naive to say there was n- no chance but uh, i'm sure anthony is going to pitch in and tell me all the reasons well, many and varied as they are, as to why I'm wrong. <laughs> no, I agree with you entirely. Oh, yeah! <laughs> it's one of the few times we agree. Um, Lovely. No, I, I, th- I think that the reason for the Doctor actually pursuing the um, monster is because of the events with Clara at the end of the episode, uh, basically uh, giving him the idea that there is a monster which is perfect at hiding. But I do think there was a creature somewhere in the episode. I, I think, as you say, to say there isn't... In, in its entirety is rubbish I mean the fact that there was the Nox I'm because it was the creature at the end of the universe it was on the last planet in existence nothing else existed that says to me that it is something like the creature from Midnight because we don't know anything about that and we don't know how it survives it can survive in inhabit- uninhabitable places exactly and it would kind of make sense because it's not the only link back to Tenant this series so far which I love <laughs> you bet you do uh, in Deep Breath there was the sister ship of the SS Madame de Pompadour that we've seen before when you know the Doctor ended up nearly marrying the mistress of the King of France because that's what you do apparently when you're a time traveller <laughs> <laughs> wandering around getting all the ladies <laughs> so I think it's yeah it's a possibility they're not they don't act exactly the same like in um the new one, it didn't like try and take anyone's voice or anything, but I guess particularly with um, him at the end of the uh, end of the universe, name is Orson Pink. Orson Pink, that's him. There was no real need, I guess. And also because it might have changed or evolved throughout those many millennia of, of just existing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do think that the. I think it could be a sort of. A future version of the creature from midnight, not the exact same one, because obviously yeah. they'd have to, as you say, live for a millennia. Um, but the maybe the same creature, but just a different one. Yeah, it acts a bit different. Yeah, I mean, um, we've in if we include the Sarah Jane adventures, there's different variations of the Slavine from Rax Chronicle So why can't there be different variations of this creature? Slavine's a family, not a species. Yeah, that's Actually. why I said Rax Chronicle You just want to say Rax Chronicle to prove you could say Rax Chronicle Let's be honest here. Yes. <laughs> But in Listen, we did actually see that there was a creature there on the bed. Yeah. Behind them, we saw that. 
it was a very blurred out picture, which could have very easily have been just another child in the care home, though. But why would they blur out if it was why, a child in a care home? I, I think it's... Blur. No, no, because it was the camera focus. It was basically just to leave it a little bit more ambiguous as to whether there was a creature or not. I think it's something that they'll go back to at some point in this season. I think they'll revisit it. I don't think they will, um, because obviously the episode was calling back to the 50th anniversary of the show. Um, so I don't think they'll call back to an episode which calls back to an episode. I kind of hope they don't really. I don't even like that they, they've showed a creature. Fear is a very personal thing, so it should be, you should leave it to, you know, let your own brain fill in the blanks. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those episodes where the, the creature in the episode uh, shouldn't uh, be called back to, uh, such as the Weeping Angel, I think we'd all agree that the episodes after Blink that featured the Weeping Angels ruined the Weeping Angels. Um, and it's just one of those Moffat episodes where it's just so brilliant, You just it, sh- it should be a standalone episode which isn't called back to. Mm-hmm. Oh, and while we're on the topic, actually, of different versions of things, what do we think of the various Capaldis throughout the universe? Because so far he's shown up three times as the Doctor, as a man in Pompeii when Vesuvius is exploding, and in Torchwood as a random politician. What do we think here? Um, I I really don't know. I mean, the fact that it's a... Um, I don't think it'll be, have anything to do with the Doctor doing something as such because um, apparently the theory of uh, why this is the case is based on something Rossity Davis said, who... Um, I, I think it's just going to be something like it's a genetic thing where sometimes this face gets put around history, possibly, and the Doctor just happens to be one of those people. I... Because, no, but he said in the first one, it's like my face is trying to tell me something, something I've forgotten. So the fact he's met, you know, this other self of him before would seem to suggest that there's something important surrounding this. It's not just a random thing. Whilst we're on the topic of uh, Capaldi throughout the universes, I thought we should take this opportunity to, com- co- uh, confirming to Nerves Policy, of course, discuss all the many and varied Malcolm Tucker quotes. <laughs> yes? Yes? No, I, don't think we can. I don't think we can. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, they did promise us that the, uh, the fact that he'd shown up a number of times in the Doctor Who universe uh, would be addressed in this series. So hopefully that will be come to later. Because didn't Martha... She had she the actress who I've forgotten her name. Yeah, it's Freeman. Yeah, she showed played, up as she her cousin, cousin. Yeah, I think and they, they did actually mention that. Yeah. So if you've appeared previously, they do like to reference it. Yeah, I mean, um, I think uh, Doctor Who is one of those shows where um, I mean, you just have to look at the class series. The number of times they've reused actors over and over again because uh, they have to have um, actors um, over and over again because there's a certain number of actors in the world that they can use. I mean, Colin Baker came back, obviously. He, the, Capaldi is not the first Doctor to have previously appeared in the show. Um, but they have, in, in Deep Breath, it was mentioned, Capaldi said, "Where did I? who frowned me this face? He's, he's obviously getting these faces from somewhere. And this has been started off as an idea in the show, not just outside within the fans. I mean, it kind of goes back to the 50th anniversary where we saw Tom Baker come as a curator. And again, we, fans amongst the Hooniverse have been thinking, well, is it Tom Baker himself as the fourth Doctor or a completely new character? I don't know what your opinions are. Uh, well, there was a um, blunder that the um, uh, Doctor Who YouTube channel did the other day um, where they uploaded that, that clip from the 50th anniversary and they titled the... the um, uh, video 11th Doctor meets the 4th Doctor which oh. um, caused a uh, a lot of hatred amongst the um, comment section of that YouTube clip as you get with any YouTube clip that um, gets anything wrong um, but then they um, cha- they changed it <laughs> later that day to 11th Doctor meets the curator which um, um, calmed down the comment section I mean you claim to have quite strong opinions on the 50th anniversary Anthony would you like to go into them seems oh, like we have a bit of time <laughs> worms, please <laughs> on, okay Anthony. give it an hour we, we watched the uh, 50th anniversary all separately actually the committee um, and we all really loved it then we came back to university and Anthony expressed extreme dislike so we took the time to sit down with him and watch it through <laughs> And his rating up went up out of ten by four points just because no, we didn't. shut him down at every point that he tried to disprove. No, I originally gave it three out of ten on first, first viewing. I'm currently giving it five out of ten. So I thought you went, you went from two to, to six. Seven. No, no, I went from two. Anthony is now fixing the numbers to make it seem like he was right. Apparently, with Anthony, the rating is not a fixed point in ten. <laughs> uh-huh. 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 Only because you do enjoy. It. I know. No, the um, 50th fun. anniversary for me, it was. Oh, I know. Because I'm a bigger fan of the classic series and um, the, the fact they brought back uh, Tom Baker was a brilliant uh, thing for me. But the way they did it um, was r- done in a way that really annoyed me because um, 
as uh, some of you will know, Tom Baker is probably the hardest person to get back to do anything because he he's not really a big fan of the show, shall we say? My Are we forgetting favorite... Eccleston here, who <laughs> refuses to be mentioned as Doctor Who. I, I, mean, I mean of the classic series, uh, Doctors. Um, My favourite theory about it is that he's the face that Tom Baker got his face from. Uh, if we're following on from that theory, that yeah. the Doctor uses faces of other people. I like the idea that the curator is the person that John Pertwee's Doctor met and got the face from to use as, as his next mm. incarnation. Uh, that would... Uh, I, I do like that idea, but there are some aspects of the script of that scene which would suggest Naturally. that he is a future version of the Doctor. And it seems a bit hypocritical, because the fourth Doctor had, like, well, not exactly an argument, but, you know, a dispute with Romana when she was choosing her new face, saying, you can't just go around nicking people's faces. That's not cool. I'm not down with that. Well, it could, it could be unintentional, don't I guess. You? Objection, Your Honour. No, is <laughs> that what we're doing? Um, I think... I, I like the idea that the Doctor gets his faces from somewhere, because... The face shop. <laughs> I, li- I like the it. The body shop, one could say. Oh, oh no. That was good. Me. I like that yeah. one. Funny. Um, does that mean, though, that Matt Smith got his face from spoilers? Spoiler alert from the uh, teacher. The teacher that. <laughs> that, the that Clara teacher, is so heavily involved with. The teacher that she, he's. I, I forget. I forgot how to speak. The teacher from that last episode. Mm. I reckon it is. No, I reckon. Exactly like fan it. fiction. Yeah, no, but he, ha- he hasn't. He's only just met this person. I don't think it could be that. Fan fiction. <laughs> okay, right. Gonna, Timey, why me? I'm going to pick flaws. Okay, then why is the random politician in Torchwood that the Doctor has never met randomly look like Capaldi? I mean, it's going to be interesting to see if they do how they cross over Torchwood and Doctor Who um, relating to Frobisher Fro- and Capaldi's Doctor now. Uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. I d- if they do reference the fact that the Doctor uh, has the same face as other people in the universe, I don't think they'll reference Torchwood. No. Because there, there aren't enough of uh, the casual viewers um, that will have seen Torchwood, whereas um, they will have seen Fires of Pompeii. I, I think that um, it, it could just be that Kaikelius had the face initially, and then his relative in the distant future is John Frobisher in Torchwood, and Capaldi got the face from somewhere along that bloodline. Maybe. I mean, <laughs> that's as good as it's gonna get. Isn't that's a bit sciencey, wincey, but whatever. <laughs> now, it's a major part uh, of Doctor Who is the music. I thought uh, we'd take this opportunity to talk about more about the music in Series Eight so far. Uh, what are you guys thinking of the music so love far? It. Absolutely love it. Yeah, it's, it's damn good. Yeah, it's 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 much better um, than uh, what Murray Gold has done before. I I do prefer. Uh, Capaldi's theme as the Doctor to I'm the Doctor which is saying a lot because I'm the Doctor was my favourite track from Doctor Who up until Series 8 um, I do like the fact they are using I'm the Doctor though in like the next time trailers every now and then because uh, it is sort of calling back it's become to... a, a really big theme yeah. of Doctor Who yeah. oh, and there was someone who um, suggested because they used I'm the Doctor in the um, 13 Doctors scene from Dare the Doctor the one scene I actually do like from the um, 50th <laughs> uh, uh, and someone just put the comment that the track should now be named We Are the Doctor not oh, I Am the Doctor and I, I, cool. I, I love that comment mm. that is very clever it's true oh. I feel it's worth mentioning something I believe it was Callum who found about the new title sequence which is based off oh, a fan yes. who actually mm. developed it which I think is really yeah, big. Yeah, I caught for, that. When, when, when I started watching the new series, I thought, I very much recognise this introduction. So And, and thought, I swear I saw this on YouTube a while ago. And they did actually... It, it was a fan um, version of the, of the introduction. It was a little bit different back then. But they the seal of Rassilon! ...was involved, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, they then went on to hire the guy, uh, and he, he was commissioned to do the new sequence. So it's really amazing what doing fan-based uh, stuff can get you involved with. Yeah, I, I can't wait till I'm the editor of the Doctor Who magazine as, as if they're taking on fans to do the work for them. I'm asp- aspiring to be the Doctor because, I mean, look at this face. I mean, obviously, listeners, you can't <laughs> see, and that's probably for your best interest. But I will, in fact, be the TARDIS next. <laughs> he has a face for radio, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, Missy, as we were talking about earlier, is the new main baddie for the finale, so we've been told. And I personally think she's quite similar to Mad- Madame Caverian. I don't know if you guys think that. She's got very similar characteristics in some shapes and forms, in my opinion. I think um, you're right in the sense of she seems like a villain. Uh, mm. I mean, uh, there's, I mean, there's a very difficult thing when it comes to the fact that Doctor has been going on for so long. When you are cast as a villain in Doctor Who and you're not, say, like Davros or... Um, um, just a generic monster if you're just a humanoid villain 
yeah, there's just a there's a mould you are sort of limited to in that role. So, yeah, it, it because we haven't seen that much of her. There's very little character development to say that she is just a villain. Yeah, there is a, there is a possibility that few people are considering that Missy could just be someone new. Yeah, you there know, is that. And that would be quite Whoa, nice. Whoa, hold the phone there. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, you can't be saying things like that. <laughs> quite, what, if she was, what if she was just somebody that we'd never met before? She was a completely new vi- uh, villain, someone that could perhaps become the new master for the new city. Aaron I, I solved like the it. mystery. <laughs> I've solved the mystery. She is new. I mean, I do think that she is new a... Who? I do think she is new to Doctor Who, the character, like, we haven't seen the character before, but I do think the Doctor has met her before, or at least she is like, been there at some point in Doctor Who. Especially life. as she uh, referenced to him as her boyfriend, uh, it which seems like she's uh, crazy and lusting yeah. after him, uh, but that doesn't suggest a previous encounter. She could just be a stalker of the Doctor. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, Missy being a new character, it could possibly mean she is a brand new character we've never met, but, um, I don't know, I mean... With what we've been told about, as you've just said, with the with the boyfriend scenario, it kind of sounds like she's someone who has met the Doctor and we should know. And Moffat has said that in the finale there will be a major foe returning, so whether she's new or not, or it could be the Cybermen, as we know they're in the finale, uh, maybe the major foe is the Cybermen? Uh, I don't know. For those of you who don't want to know some spoilers for the... F- uh, fifth Sorry, guys. Uh, uh, stop listening for a second now. Um, <laughs> they have been seen on set uh, a classic series Cyberman head uh, being uh, sort of thrown on the ground by the newest I version of the, the <laughs> uh, newest version of the Cyber uh, Cybermen. So um, that could be the old foe returning a classic series Cyberman. I want to see the Slovene return myself. Or Cyber Slovene. Cyber. So I thought they were probably they were one of, the first season. They were one of the most original villains. I like them, and I think they should come back because they fart on set, and it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult to be uh, hosting a radio show where you're actually actively trying to avoid spoilers. I just had to stand there whilst uh, with my fingers in my ears trying to avoid any spoilers. You mean while I was talking about the Cybermen? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> the Cyber Silurians. Um, yeah, but. I don't know about them being new because we haven't had a new one for the finale yet, have we? Uh, I mean, we see we've had we sort of had Daleks. Kavarian for series six, even though we had seen her before. Um, Kavarian, but we had a was... silence as well, and yeah, your argument's very flawed here, Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a bit like you complained about how the Zygons were just randomly there in the fiftieth. So just know. having a random person for the finale feels a bit. For not finale. I, I, I more complain about the use of the Zygons in the 50th rather than... I mean, they were the main bad guys. I mean, I would have preferred it if they were just there to introduce David Tennant's character to the show. They shouldn't have been the main bad guys. Plus, Moffat did compl- sort of rewrite, rewrite how the Zygons um, copy uh, people to how they copy people in the classic series. Uh, so that did annoy me a little bit. And if you guys would like to share your opinions, please tweet us uh, at Nerve Radio or at BU Whovian Sock. Now, I think it, we should move on to the review of the latest episode, The Caretaker. Uh, we'll do quite a full review because we've got a bit of time. So, guys, what did you think of the latest episode? Well, I'll just take this opportunity to say that uh, we watched this with the, uh, the Whovian Society. So, a shout out to all of our new members who are Woo! listening now. And not we to mention all of our faithful old members who have stayed from last year and not been uh, t- not turned away and been terrified by what they've seen already because <laughs> the Hoovian Society is certainly a unique uh, experience. <laughs> Might be unique, sorry. Um, oh, very good. <laughs> but, I'll uh, just leave now. It's cool. the, the caretaker was really uh, well received in the room. I think the whole the whole room was laughing for the duration of the episode, really. It was a very entertaining, very funny episode. You can really tell um, when you watch an episode live <laughs> with the Whovian Society, how much people in the room care yes. about it, from the fact that when uh, BBC iPlayer cut out for 10 seconds, everyone went, and so, <laughs> and so that was a moment where I thought, oh no, don't please don't do that for the last 10 minutes of the episode. You know you're going to see a good film when everyone in the cinema laughs or, yes. or finds something very good, because typically when you're in a big situation like that, people tend to keep the, their views to their own, but when everyone laughs or is shocked by something on screen, that's when you know the, it's really moving. Anyway, yeah. Should we move on to the actual content of the episode? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very Rather than just shouting out our committee, our society. Who we love. Committee. We are very fond of them. So, yeah, I particularly liked it. I watched it literally before coming here, so I wasn't with them yesterday. I'm sorry. Um, and I like the way that the enemy was not the point of the episode. The enemy was just there to make the Doctor be in the school. 
and the whole point of the episode was about character development and it being a bit fun. And I particularly like the way the Doctor just kind of vainly assumed that, oh, this person looks like the old me. Clara's clearly into him. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> like I, I, I did like that um, part of the episode, to be honest, because the uh, Deep Breath did sort of uh, talk a lot about how uh, the Clara, Clara fancied the 11th Doctor. And this sort of... It wouldn't. Uh, uh, yeah, but this uh, part of uh, the episode sort of reiterated the fact that she wasn't in love with uh, Matt Smith's Doctor. It sort of reiterated that she is her own person. She isn't just all about Matt Smith's Doctor. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I personally, after each episode uh, at the BU Whovian Society, we put our hands up and rate out of 10 what we thought of the episode. And there was me and one other person who rated it 10 out of 10. And I, I just personally thought it was so funny. Um, like, the, just the little things like when the doctor says, oh, the sign says keep out, but it actually said go away humans. I think that's so Time Lord and just Doctor-like. And I think it was brilliant. And how he interacted with Courtney was very funny. And it was just nice to see that even though he is seen sometimes as a grumpy old man, he will uh, be nice and take uh, Courtney, for example, through space t- to see it, even though she she kind of started to feel a bit sick towards <laughs> the end there. I think it harkens back a little bit, because we were talking about William Hartnell earlier, and he wandered off with a 15-year-old. She was his granddaughter, but still. It's like, you feel like in 2,000 years, he hasn't changed that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do like the um, fact that they are um, basically showing... Capaldi's kinder side in the sort of lighter episodes because yeah. um, although, although I like the fact that he's a dark doctor I don't want the fans that don't like the fact that he's a dark doctor to get alienated by it and it's nice to have a filler episode with substance because having filler episodes there's the tendency that they put a mini story in there and if it's not particularly entertaining then it loses all sort of character of the show but to have a, a filler episode as it were with loads of good bits and really funny and really developing the characters was was really interesting i felt that it was one for the classic series um fans because there were quite a lot of uh sort of classic series uh lines in there yes. i mean the fact they were in coal hill school yeah. alone <laughs> yeah. um, was probably the <coughs> biggest one going back to twitter uh, as we mentioned earlier addison mentioned that some of the doctors are no lo- are no longer with us such as william hartnell uh Patrick Troughton and John Pertwee, and he mentioned, without blowing the budget, how do you think they'd make a multi-story doctor, multi-doctor story, sorry, with them all in? Anthony? Uh, yes, I mean, I think uh, when it comes to a TV uh, series, they need to sort of um, uh, look towards what uh, Big Finish do, which is, because uh, obviously uh, the actors uh, that have played the Doctor, with the exception of the first three, are uh, also live. And Big Finish do audio stories of the Doctor, because obviously their voices don't change over time. Uh, Pete Davidson's has got a little bit deeper, but he does try and uh, go a little bit more high-pitched for the audio stories. Uh, but uh, for the 50th anniversary, they did one called Light at the End, which had Doctors 1 through 8, and they just got uh, actors to voice at, uh, Doctors 1 to 3. Uh, and a nice little... Uh, thing for the show, they got William Russell, who was a companion of the first Doctor, to voice the first Doctor, and a uh, 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 person played J- Jamie to uh, Fraser Hines uh, to voice the second Doctor. And uh, they weren't in it that much because obviously they don't sound perfect as the, their respective Doctors. But I think something like that. I mean, that was one of the things I didn't like in the 50th anniversary with, with the all 13 Doctors because they used. Um, archive footage obviously they have to do that but they used archive audio of the doctors as well half those doctors are still alive they could have easily have got them back to do a uh, a new bit of audio for all of them go gallifrey stand just every all those living doctors there's no and that reason, been a much yeah sorry there's no reason they can't yeah hire actors um who look and sound there's it's not going to be too difficult yeah, I, mean, I mean make them up a bit and throw in a bit of cgi there there's there's not a lot standing in the way to, it's mainly the the storyline they've got to get right as long as mm. that's good people won't mind too much yeah the trick would be finding an enemy that's worth 13 doctors I mean, what requires it that was one thing that was very interesting about um, Light at the End because they met uh, Nicholas Briggs who voices the Daleks wrote that episode um, and he managed to find a uh, story which uh, basically meant that there needed to be more Doctors there it was basically the Master had um, managed to get hold of, hold of a weapon which basically deleted uh, parts of someone from that part in time and what he was doing was going through at different points in the Doctor's time stream and removing that part of him, endangering the Doctor's existence at different points in his life, which I thought that required a multi-Doctor uh, story because there were loads of Doctors and they needed to help their other incarnations. 
Yeah. Anyone else like to add now? <laughs> Um, okay, we've got a bit more time. Sorry, guys. Um, as mentioned earlier, we do have a convention coming up next year. So, Anthony, do you want to tell us about how it came about and a bit more about the convention? Uh, yes, I mean, how it came about. It was basically uh, towards the end of uh, last academic year, I was thinking of things of how the Hoovian Society could improve in the next year. And I thought, uh, well, with a little bit of um, uh, uh, sort of a lot of emailing, I should say, of loads of agents, of loads of actors from the show it is possible that we could uh, put on a science fiction convention at the um, university and uh, I uh, emailed around a few people at the university to sort of find out if it was logistically possible and we found out yes we could use one of the buildings um, for the convention and I then pursued to email a load of agent, agents of actors um, like I said earlier we won't announce anyone that's coming to the convention yet because that's uh, yet to be a surprise spoilers. yeah spoilers um, yes um, that is on the uh, 21st of February next year thank you uh, just so if, if you, some of you aren't members of the Human Society here at Bournemouth University and you're interested about joining we meet every Wednesday and Saturday on Saturdays currently we're watching the new episodes of the air and on Wednesdays we watch past episodes and sometimes new Who episodes and we do other things like events we've been to the Dot Who experience recently uh, and we we do filming nights as well uh, for, for our YouTube channel. It, and like I say, if you want to find out more, go onto the website, which is hubian.co.uk, and we've got a Facebook group, um, BU Hubians. If you, if you type Bournemouth University... Uh, Sorry? Hoovian yes, Society. Bournemouth Hoovian Society, you'll find us there. And as I say on Twitter, you can find us at BU Hoovian Sock. Um, so we've talked quite a lot about uh, our favourite doc- well the doctors so let's go on to about our favourite doctors personally mine is Matt Smith I think he's so elegant and bow ties are cool <laughs> and when he regenerated I tried not to cry as much as I could so I'm going to open that up to the society now and well the committee sorry and what do you think who's your favourite doctor and why uh, well it has to be Paul McGann because uh, Every, every single time he's appeared on screen, which is only twice, once in the Doctor Who movie and once in Night of the Doctor, he is absolutely flawless at playing the Doctor. I mean, um, there are a few bits in the movie which I don't like, but I put that down to the script, not to Paul McGann, because obviously he wasn't in control of what he was um, being told to say. Uh, but being a fan of the audio stories that Big Finish put, put out, I, I, th- I think he's really good at doing audio stories, and I... I, I like audio stories as a concept because it basically it's it's Doctor Who I can listen to on the go. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't get out my laptop on the bus and start watching Waters of Mars, I, I, but I can put in my um, headphones and listen to Light at the End. So, I, Paul McGann has got to be the Doctor for me. My favourite Doctor uh, is David Tennant. Um, uh, and obviously a lot of people feel that's just a fangirl opinion but yes it is yes it is ladies <laughs> hey, come on now I know he's attractive but uh, <laughs> but I really do I, I like Russell T Davis's era because although a lot of people say it's not up to scratch with the current series it was a different show back then it was a bit uh, different and how it was written and they didn't know what audience what, what the audience would want and what sort of show it was going to be but now that Capaldi has taken over from Matt Smith I am really liking the modern writing and the modern effects and everything coupled with the brilliant uh, performance by Peter Capaldi. So it is possibly going to change soon, but we'll we'll see. Is it just a case of we have a thing for Scottish actors? I was going to say, <laughs> sexy, aren't just... they? <laughs> <laughs> Look at these eyebrows! <laughs> <laughs> They're attack eyebrows! Um, yeah, so moving swiftly on. Uh, I like the Ninth Doctor. Again, yeah, not really up to date, and some of the episodes are a bit iffy like the Slithian and blowing up parliament which is a bit but I really liked him as a doctor just the way he acted and how he could be very grumpy and then a bit bipolar and go completely zany and really smiley later like where he's really angry in uh, the mayor who's a Slithian in Wales and she tries to teleport away and he's like lol no brings, <laughs> so her, right brings back. her back again <laughs> and again and again and then goes on a date with her because you know that's obviously <laughs> what one does I just like the way he reacts to things. I thought he was a very good doctor to restart the show on. And, you know, he, he summed up quite well the t- how the Time War kind of went down, even though they were keeping a mystery of what actually happened. And so he's... This, sorry, go on, I guess. That we could go from probably Seven, Doctor, who, you know, who was probably the last people that, you know, the fa- older fans had seen, 
two of the eighth who was very bright and happy and then suddenly you know we had nine just grumpy wearing jumpers very austere stupid apes <laughs> i just thought he was a very good post time one yes very good what he said uh, as what well, i was about to mention um i do like chris feckelson as well because he is from the north which i can relate to very well <laughs> as i am from <laughs> up north because oh, okay. i'm from up north aaron what is your who is your favorite doctor tom baker because he has a scarf and his mum told him to like him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can yeah, okay. find yeah, yeah, the, the reason that Aaron just said that on our YouTube uh, channel. And I also forgot to mention, if you actually want to sign up to the BU Hearing Society, if you go onto the Subi website, there is a link where you can sign up for £1 if you can spare that. Yeah, I mean, uh, that will cover everything we do throughout the entire year. We have quizzes, uh, filming nights, um, watch old episodes. It, it just covers everything apart from the convention. And you have to pay for that. membership card. Yes. It's all pretty and nice and white and shiny. This year we're actually introducing a grouping <laughs> system, uh, which is why we're doing the membership cards. Um, and when you come along to our meetings, we're going to start sorting you into various groups. Um, very much, uh, not, not too dissimilar from Harry Potter. Uh, and we'll have inter-society inter competitions and quiz nights to try and get a bit uh, more involvement from everyone and hopefully uh, give out some lovely prizes at the end. Yeah, I mean, those are four groups that you spoke of. Uh, of the five committee members, I, I remain impartial, and the other four uh, committee members are the heads, if you will, of each of those groups. So if you guys want to say what your groups are and sort of what sort of personalities end up in your groups. My group is Tortured Institute, and we're meant to be the Ravenclaw House, the clever, brainy ones, but mostly we just seem like the loud ones so far. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but yeah, it's fun, it's nice, it's happy. We're working on a slogan. <laughs> So yeah, uh, I'm Callum, and oh, I'm cool. the events manager. No, my my group is the uh, Children of Time, and we have been likened to Gryffindor. Keyword children. Uh, <laughs> we're not infantile. We're we're very grown up and sensible, and we have adventures, and it's brilliant. Um, so we too have yet to come up with a slogan. I don't think anyone's actually managed to come up with one yet. But join join Children of Time if you can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tom, and I lead Hermits United. Well, Hermits United, as you've probably guessed by the name Hermits, are meant to are meant. Well, the group is meant for the shy members of the society. But well, that doesn't seem to be going to plan because quite a lot of the members in Hermits are very loud. <laughs> <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that, you know? No, way. of course not. And uh, I'm Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Hi Aaron. Aaron. And I lead the Cult of Scaro, <laughs> uh, which has been likened to Slytherin by many. Uh, and we attract the, the evil members of the Hoobians. <laughs> Such as Hazel Jess. Hi, oh, Hazel. speaking of Hazel, Agatha Christie. See? Promised. <laughs> We've had a couple more tweets in. We've had another tweet from Safi that just simply says celery. So thank you very much for that. And we've had another tweet from Addison who says, if there was a 10th anniversary special for the new series, what would you have in it to celebrate the last 10 years? Uh, David Tennant! <laughs> well, I th it's, it's very difficult because I, be I don't think they would bother doing it if they couldn't get Chris Eccleston back. And I think the chances of him coming back are very, very slim. But if it did happen, hmm. I'd like it to be quite different from 50th. I don't want it to just be a rehash mm. of that. It want to be something that the new Doctors have faced particularly. Maybe a bit lighter as well. Yeah, karma. Yeah. I, also plot resolving. I do think that the 50th anniversary didn't play enough on the classic series. I mean, I could easily... If 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 you ignore the bit where all the past Doctors come back right at the end, uh, it could very easily have been called a 10th anniversary special. I, I disagree. I get that the bringing Gallifrey back is a new Who problem. I acknowledge, but there was quite a lot of references to classic, I think. Like the title sequences, lots of things were mentioned, Coal Hill School came back. There's just bits, if you look for it. Yeah, I, I agree there were a lot of references, but there weren't sort of enough things that actually physically came back. Like, they could have had loads of the uh, past companions sort of just passing them in the street, for instance, and that it wouldn't have blown the budget if they just had a few more actors in there every now and then. You just said they're not using the classic series to its full potential. Having a bunch of the classic series companions just wander by is the very definition of not doing their full potential. No, no, no. I mean, I, I don't mean in the sense of don't, like, bring them back for, like, the main companion for the entire episode. I mean in the sense of, uh, like, actually just having them there, not just a picture on the wall. Mm, I guess. <laughs> anyway, yeah, back to the point of the question. Tenth anniversary special. We could bring the Slitheens back. Everyone loves the Slitheen. 
Just everyone who's not like the Daleks What's or Cybermen. What's not good? What there's not to love about the Slavine, a gaseous green monster? The Slavine, the weird gargoyle things. Um, Weeping angels, silence, I, Daleks. I think not Daleks. That's that's not new. I think the Slavine are one of the worst things to come out of the new series. <laughs> oh God! No, because with the Slavine, you can tell that the only reason they've reused them. Uh, at the end of series one and in the Sarah Jane adventures is just because they can't be bothered to make a new monster as in the actual set no <laughs> <laughs> nice and concise from Aaron there <laughs> <laughs> I mean um, go- coming back to the promised land do we think there is any reference to Gallifrey there do we think the promised land is set on Gallifrey I personally think that uh, I mean the latest episode does hint that I'm wrong on this uh, but I don't think the promised land is the same place as where all these people are ending up. I just think it's like how um, uh, Chris Addison's character says, there are many uh, sort of names for what this place is called, and he says one of them is the promised land. I reckon the uh, promised land itself is Gallifrey, but this place that they are go- all these people are going to at the end of various episodes isn't Gallifrey itself. <laughs> Um, my personal opinion on the promised land is it's something like what happened with River Song, where their physical body dies, but their consciousness gets taken somewhere else. And this kind of works with the Time Lord lady theory, because they could just grab them from time and then take them to wherever they're taking them for whatever purpose they've got, nefarious or otherwise. I think this that doesn't necessarily mean that, that they're dying then, because the only one we've actually seen die, in inverted commas, um, is the half-faced man who was uh, mostly robot, um, which can easily fix a robot. We saw the guy in the episode yesterday's arm come off. That's pretty dead. You know, he was blown into many pieces. That's and he had his arm back when he was in the promised land. He was absolutely fine when he was up there. Because that's his consciousness. He would, you know, he would see himself as complete in his brain, and therefore he is. Well, if he saw himself as complete, then he'd see himself as a full man, because that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to complete himself. But no, because that's not how his... We're going to get into psychology here. Sorry, <laughs> listeners, this is going to get into a psychology <laughs> argument. That is not how the brain works. <laughs> you don't. Your brain does not conceptualise you of what you'd like to be. It conceptualises you as what you are. If yeah, I'm n- wrong, feel science, free to bro. <laughs> if I'm wrong, feel free to treat in. I'd understand. <laughs> yeah, no, but this is um, this is a robot we're talking about, not not a human being. Anyway, as this isn't a psychology argument, <laughs> back to Tom. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to round it up there, guys. So thank you very much for all your opinions there uh, to the committee, and thank you very much to you listening at home. I hope you've managed to bear with us. Sorry if we've gone on and on. But hopefully we'll have another show for you soon, but you'll just have to wait and see. Spoilers. So once again, thank you for listening, and goodbye. Good night.